Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we'll get started now. My name is Gary Allen. I'm the CEO of Lean Law. I'm uh, happy to be here today with Ann Gwynn, who is going to give us a, a great presentation about how lawyers can stop under earning. Um, and uh, so uh, you all should be seeing um, her uh, uh, her uh, presentation in front of you. Um, let me just give you a little bit of introduction though. So uh, first, if you could just indicate in the chat window that you can hear me, that would be helpful. Um, uh, just give us a few indications that the, the audio is working. Um, the chat window is uh, also, it looks like we, we're, we're doing well on the audio. Um, if we have an echo or anything that shows up during the presentation, please let me know. Um, the chat window will also be the place where you can submit your questions as we go along. So please do that. We're hoping we'll have time at the end to address those. If not, we'll get back with you after the presentation. Um, we are recording this webinar, so that will be available to you afterwards along with the slides and the uh, summary that will be emailed to you afterwards along with information about how to get in touch with either Lean Law or Ann. Um, and so uh, let me just start to give this some context by introducing myself. Um, I am uh, this, as I mentioned, the CEO of Lean Law, which is a software company which creates timekeeping and billing software for law firms that deeply integrates into QuickBooks. My background is that I'm a 25 year, 30 year now practicing lawyer and um, am very passionate about making law firms more efficient. And um, I've got, I waited for better tools to come along for a long time before finally deciding I needed to do something about it. And that's what gave birth um, to Lean Law. And in the process of practicing law, um, I, had to, I had a nice practice. I had a million dollar practice um, at the height of my practice, um, but I had to reinvent myself uh, several times along the way. So um, the sort of things that Anne will be talking to you today, particularly the emotional and motivational parts of how to stop under earning in your practice really resonate with me. I'm hoping we will have an interesting conversation for you that will be helpful for your practices. Um, let me introduce Ann Gwynn now. Um, uh, and she's going to talk to you today about the seven secrets lawyers need to master to stop under earning. Um, and Ann is, in my opinion, one of the leading law practice management experts in the country. Um, she's written a book for the ABA called Minding Your Own Business, uh, the Solo and Small Law Firm Lawyer's Guide to Profitable Practice. And she's working on a new book for the ABA on under earning. And she's worked with thousands of law firms over her career. So she really understands the small and mid-sized law firms and the challenges that uh, you go through. Um, and before I turn this over to Anne, I want to, um, to do one poll because we did something interesting today. We invited lawyers, both um, Anne's uh, contacts as well as Lean Laws, but we also invited uh, accounting professionals to join us. A very important uh, uh, resource for a small law firm is a great bookkeeper or accountant and really, um, as I, Anne will probably mention, you should not uh, have a law practice without having help on that front. And they're very important partners um, for, for Lean Law um, that, you know, help us help lawyers get better in their practices, the financial aspects of their practice. So the first thing I want to do is just understand who is here with a quick poll. Are you a lawyer? Are you accounting professional or are you something else? So here goes the poll. All right, so I hope everybody can see that. Okay, we're getting lots of responses. I have about, okay, wait, just another minute or two. Got most of you responding. Come on now, pay attention. Still need a few more responses if you don't mind. Okay, that's probably all we're going to get. This is interesting. We have about 75% lawyers, 
21% accounting professionals and and uh, three three four percent of the rest. So thank you for that. Um, and I'll share the results with you so you can see that. And now what I'd like to do is um, just uh, turn this over to Anne for the presentation. Again, I'll probably be jumping in from time to time with questions or comments. So uh, uh, appreciate everybody's uh, um, attention to this important presentation. Thank you, Gary. The first thing I need to do is apologize to everybody. My gardener just showed up a day early, so you're going to hear the lawnmower for just a few minutes, uh, and then he'll go to the backyard. So timing is everything, as they say. Uh, Thursday's his normal day. I thought we were safe. Uh, anyway, thank you so much, Gary, for the fine introduction, for asking me to participate in this program. I want to tell you a little bit about how I come to this uh, interest in under-earning. As Gary mentioned, I've been consulting with solo and small firms for the last 26 years, and I have been in the legal field a lot longer than Gary has. Uh, I know uh, the ins and outs of a law practice, I think, backwards and forwards by this time. And over the years, I have come to the realization that every attorney in this country is under earning in some way or another. Uh, when I talk about under earning, I'll explain what that means exactly in a moment, but I'm not talking about uh, raising your rates, gouging your clients to make more money. I'm talking about just tightening up and straightening up your management skills because that's what it boils down to. And that's how attorneys are under earning. They're making choices in their day-to-day -day operations that cause under earning. They may not realize the long-term effect but I'm going to give you some eye-opening information today that's going to make you rethink some of those decisions. So uh, that is it. Uh, I've got such a passion for this issue of under-earning because I want to see all attorneys get paid what they're worth, get paid for the value of their work, and uh, get paid a living. And I read an article several years ago that said, more than 50% of the attorneys in this country make less than $50,000 a year. I have right now in mind two clients whose paralegal makes more money than they do on a monthly basis. So um, that is where my passion is. Let me start out really uh, quickly here with a story about an attorney I met several years ago. I was teaching a monthly class on uh, basically how to build a better practice. And this um, woman joined, uh, I think, the second session around. She had just moved to the area from back east. And I am originally from Washington, so this was up in the state of Washington. And uh, she had opened up a practice. She was doing immigration law and, uh, and some bankruptcy. She was telling us over the course of the next few months, all of the things she was doing for marketing, and she had brilliant strategies. I was amazed at the things that she was doing and the payoff she was getting from these different uh, strategies that she was employing. I really thought this person has everything all together here. And then after about five months, she dropped out of the class, and it was about two months before the class ended. Uh, and I thought that was kind of odd, and I thought, well, maybe she's doing so well she figures she just doesn't need this anymore i don't know so didn't think much more about it about a year later she called me and she said i think i need to work with you and i said what's the problem and she said i'm not making enough money i'm working really hard we have lots of clients i'm just not making enough money and um, i asked her how much she had taken out of her practice the year before now this attorney had practiced for 13 years but in a nonprofit. This was the first time she had been on her own in a law firm. And uh, when I asked her how much she had taken out of the firm the year before, she'd been in business 18 months at that point. Uh, she said she had taken $5,000 only out of the business for the full year. And I was a little surprised at that. And I thought, well, she's just starting out. Um, you know, maybe she's taking the wrong clients or whatever. I don't know. So I agreed I would meet with her and when we sat down to talk, I was trying to figure out why she was earning so little. And um, what came out uh, of a, a long session was 
she had never billed a client in all the 18 months she'd been in business. And I asked her how she was able to keep the doors open, what she was doing for money. And she said, well, some of my work is flat fee. So in the state of Washington, if your fee agreement says that the fee is earned upon receipt, it is yours. So she was living off of the flat fees that she was taking and uh, paying her legal assistant and her part-time paralegal and paying her rent and all that, nothing left over to pay herself. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, why is it you've not billed any clients in 18 months? You're doing some hourly work. And she said, well, it's not my fault. My assistant refuses to do the bills because she feels like they've paid enough up front. Uh, and I, I was sitting there staring at her incredulous, thinking, you're kidding me. Your paralegal is calling the shots in this office. Your paralegal is dictating how much you're going to earn. Um, and she went on and on about this. I'm sorry, the paralegal legal assistant was the one that was the block here. And I, she went on to explain more about this. And uh, I said, okay, fine. First thing we do is fire the legal assistant. And then we get somebody in here who's going to do your bills and do them on a regular basis. Uh, and I ascertained she had time records and all this just hadn't billed. And uh, we met later uh, with her uh, significant other. And so I, in front of the significant other, asked this attorney what she would like to take out of the business. And she thought long and hard. And she said, I would love to take $1,000 a month out of my practice. And I said, that, is that enough to contribute to you know, the community pot at home and, you know, fund retirement and give you a little pocket money and, you know, whatever. And she said, well, I'd really like to take 2000 but that will never happen. And it broke my heart to think, here is this wonderful attorney, this wonderful person, so giving and caring, and she would be happy taking $12,000 a year out of her business to live on. Um, and I thought that 24000 a year was completely out of the realm of possibility. So I went ahead and we did three and a half hours together. And I, when I was done, I was exhausted and thought, this is some of the finest work I have ever done. This, I just gave her such helpful information. And I went away. And I never heard from her again. About a year later, she phoned. And she said, I think I need to work with you again. And I was, quite frankly, surprised she was still in business. And uh, I said, what's going on? And she said, well, I've got two full-time associates working for me. I've got another one starting in the fall. I've got a legal assistant and two paralegals part-time working for me. The firm is growing fast. We have more work than we can handle. Uh, and uh, I need to know how to control it. I need to know how to handle this growth. And I was so stunned because of our previous meeting a year earlier. And uh, I said, I'm just thrilled with the turnaround here. This is just amazing what happened. And she said, you gave me the four, you gave me the best advice anyone has ever given me in 13 years in practice. Four little words. And I said, what, what were the four little words that turned the corner for you here? And she said, bill clients get money. And I thought, I can't believe that she needed someone to tell her that. But she did. And when she started listening to that, she started making money. So she was a classic under earner here. But let's talk about what under earning actually is. Oh, Gary, my screen isn't moving. And if we need to switch over, let me know. We, I can run, uh, pull up those slides off of uh, my, uh, on my screen if you'd rather. No, it's just not moving at all. All right, if you can call that up, please. Um, okay, hang on a second, everybody. Maybe I, maybe I can do it a different way here. Wait, I got it. There, there was a, a thing at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so what is under earning? Simply put, it's this. It's earning below your potential or less than you need. So everybody's earning point is different. Everybody's nut to crack, what they want to earn, what they need to earn is different. So I can't say, you know, if you're earning less than 40000 a year, you're under earning. 
it depends on what your needs are and what your potential is. But that's the basic um, premise of under earning. So there are two types of under earning. One is passive under earning, and that's choosing not to do something or failing to do something that would have resulted in you making more money. And some examples of passive under earning would be failing to raise your rates, uh, not spending money on software or equipment that would make you more efficient and productive, not tending to your marketing, not billing for all of the time worked, procrastinating on tasks, not controlling the length of your initial consultations. So you can see there are many ways that you can under earn by the choices that you make here. So let's look then at the other form of under earning, active under earning. This is knowingly doing something that will cause you to under earn. And that would be accepting a client who's, whom you believe will not be able to pay your fees, providing excessive pro bono services, discounting your fees, writing off time, handling certain administrative or non-billable tasks yourself that could be outsourced, or bidding a project low to beat your competition. So how does under-earning show up in your life? Well, some symptoms of under-earning would be not living the life you want, not being able to provide the lifestyle you'd like for your family, not making enough money to cover your basic needs, not having enough money each month to be able to save for emergencies or retirement, not being able to give your staff the raises or bonuses they deserve, living in deprivation, not being able to do the things with the business that you would like, constant stress about money, and I would add one in here, um, which is a big one for a lot of uh, under earners, and that is uh, major tax issues, uh, owing lots and lots of money to IRS. Hmm. So do you think you might be an under earner? Uh, there are some simple questions that we can ask uh, to help you determine if that would be you. And in your handout materials, I have provided you with um, a self quiz that you can take at your leisure here. And I'm just looking here, bear with me one second. Just one second here. All right. I'm not going to, for time's sake, I'm not going to do the, the self quiz. I'm going to direct you to your handout materials for that. But uh, I was going to ask you just a few questions here. As we go through the presentation, I'm going to identify m a number of the ways that attorney self uh, er, under earned. So you will um, certainly have the opportunity to identify yourself as a, an under earner at that point in time. And just for everybody's, uh, uh, so, so you understand you will receive that, those materials in the email after the uh, webinar. So um, please fill out that, uh, that quiz when, or that uh, poll when you do. And I think I might need to, you need to do something on your end? Um, I, I'm going to skip. We were going to poll everybody about that, but uh, um, we will uh, right. do that later. Move forward here. Okay. All right. Under earning begins here in your head, the gray matter between your ears. I can help with systems and procedures. I can help with, you know, establishing billing rates and all of this. I can't help with what you're telling yourself about your your the, the value of your services about what you should be charging about how your clients view you and all of this but this is where it begins the stories that we tell ourselves uh, i'm working with an attorney right now and one of the things we are working on is his self-talk what he tells himself um, about himself and how bad he makes himself feel every day to the point that he's paralyzed uh, when i began working with him he was trying to recreate timesheets from two years previous. Uh, that is massive under earning and there's simply no way to do that. There's simply no way to go back and create a, a, a reasonably fair timesheet or bill from that. 
So you need to think about the messages that you send yourself about under earning. And a lot of our attitudes towards money, in fact, most of our attitudes towards money begin with our parents and the way they talked about money. Uh, I know with my mom, it was always money doesn't grow on trees. And uh, I spent a lot of time walking around the neighborhood looking at trees and by golly, she was right. I saw acorns and I saw walnuts and I saw all sorts of things. I never saw money. So that made me think that money isn't um, easily accessible. The other thing was on Sunday afternoons, I used to beg her to take us for rides in our little town. There was an area which we called the doctor's houses because those are the people that had money and they had lovely big homes. So I would beg her to take us on a drive through the doctor's houses so that we could admire the homes. And it was always just kind of unspoken that this is where people with money live. That's not where we live and that's not where we're ever going to live. So that's a lesson that I picked up early on. Another one was um, my uh, parents divorced when I was quite young and my mom became our sole support. She got a job with the government. One of the perks was two weeks paid vacation. As a child, I could never understand why we weren't going to Disneyland every year for vacation. And she would say, we can't afford it. And I would say, why can't we afford it? It's a paid vacation. I, my concept as a child of money was that her employer would pay for us to take a vacation wherever we wanted to go. So of course I wanted Disneyland. Um, kids have the inability to uh, interpret messages uh, necessarily as adults would. So we hear things that our parents tell us about money and we absorb that. Another uh, thing that I see with attorneys is living in a money fog. I ask attorneys all the time, how much money do you need to earn? Uh, and I rarely get an appropriate answer. I hear things instead like, oh, enough, or, oh, well, my expenses aren't very great. I don't need a lot to live on. And I will continually say, not good enough, quantify it, give me a number. I can build a plan for you. If you tell me I want to earn $100,000, then I can help you figure out how we're going to do that. But if you say I need enough, I can't build a plan for that because I don't know what that means. Is that $5,000 a year or $100,000 a year or $500,000 a year? So living in a money fog, understanding exactly what your needs are. Um, I have my clients prepare a budget for home as well as the budget for the office because most of them don't know how much it costs them to run their homes. Um, and you have to know, you have to know your money goals to be able to make that money. Uh, part of setting your billing rates, which I'll talk about in a moment here, is knowing how much you have to earn to keep the business going and, and to uh, pay, your, pay yourself here. So living in the money fog is a definite sign of under earning here. Sometimes it's a matter of lowest self-esteem. We don't see ourselves as others do. I see this frequently. This is such a big problem. Attorneys undervaluing themselves because they feel like, uh, you know, what they did was a no brainer or uh, whatever. And that they just don't place the value on themselves. And if you don't put the value on yourself, your clients aren't going to. They're going to adopt what they see from you. And if you are constantly apologizing and putting yourself down, they're going to start thinking there's something wrong. Sometimes uh, I see attorneys thinking Prince Charming will save them. They're holding out to win the lottery or they're going to be the sole heir of an elderly uh, relative's estate. So they're hanging on for that or they think there's going to be a big windfall from a case. Uh, the class I taught a few years ago, an attorney talked every month, every month about this $125,000 fee he was going to get as co-counsel in this case. And he was hanging on for that by the skin of his teeth. Every month it was, well, you know, we're, it's almost there. I did this document, that document, sent it off to, you know, the co-counsel on the other side of the state. And one time he came in and he was completely dejected. And we asked what happened, and he said co-counsel had blown a, a statute, and the case was done, and there was no 125000 coming. He had banked everything on that money and ended up losing his house. He lost his business. He lost his staff. He was going through a divorce at the time this was happening anyway. 
ended up applying for a job as a uh, counsel in Guam because this was during a downturn in the economy. Nobody was hiring in his general location. Um, so hanging on thinking something or someone else is going to save you from your money worries is really a fool's errand. Uh, you just simply don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes people under earn to punish someone. Uh, I, an attorney called me a few weeks ago. I had heard my under earning webinar I'd done for, I think it was the ABA a couple of years ago. And she's from a culture where the man in the family is supposed to support the family. Uh, they're living here, but they still uh, are heavily influenced by the culture in which both were raised. And her husband doesn't work and he doesn't want to work. And she is extremely resentful and acknowledged that she may be in some way trying to punish him and force him to work by continually not billing clients or underbilling or um, turning away good work or whatever. So there are a lot of motivations behind why we under earn. Sometimes under earning is born out of fear and that's simply the belief that we can't handle whatever might happen. Uh, there's the fear of success and the fear of failure. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment here, the fear of success. Uh, when I encountered that, looked it full in the face and was stunned by what this attorney told me. But sometimes it's a fear of giving something up. Um, you might have to uh, change the, the way you, uh, the place you go for lunch. Maybe you go to some cut rate place and now you're going to feel silly going there or uncomfortable going there or, uh, whatever, maybe where you shop, losing friends. If you have friends in your socioeconomic air, uh, level, you may fear losing friends because if you start uh, developing a greater income and having more money to spend and they're not able to keep up with you, they may be, feel uncomfortable and pull away from you. You may have a uh, fear of raised expectations of yourself, of not being able to handle the money or having the money taken away from you. And, uh, and that's the big one. Yes. Yeah, can I jump in on that one? Because that yeah, one yeah, yeah. really hits home with me. Um, I think the way I experienced this in my career is in the form of perfectionism, which I think is a lot of attorneys suffer from that. And yeah. uh, that, you know, I had a really, I worked in a big firm in San Diego, and I had this really tight niche practice there the, that was a, a fraction of environmental law. And so I felt very comfortable doing that because I knew everything about that tiny little niche in law. And then I moved to Idaho and you couldn't have a tiny little niche in Idaho. You had to branch out. So, you know, and, and my fear of not knowing everything and, you know, not being the absolute expert on everything around that practice was really holding me back in my practice and you know there's a it took a lot to kind of break out of that perfectionism and go hey you can still be a good lawyer in a lot of other areas and you know and uh but not have to feel that you know need to to move to that level of comfort i wonder if you've experienced that with uh clients that you've worked with i have in fact uh, i'm working with a client right now who keeps telling me that uh, perfectionism is the biggest block to uh, getting things done um, and he suffers from this greatly um, and yes perfectionism I'm going to talk in just a moment Gary about something you alluded to here which is the imposter syndrome uh, thinking that you know people are going to find out I don't know what I'm doing or I'm not as good as I they think I am or whatever so uh, lots and lots of different reasons attorneys enter in, but that's certainly one of them. The money being taken away from you. A few years ago, I was in Traverse City, Michigan, and I was doing a full day workshop on under earning. And um, there'd been a snafu with the local bar and the promotion had not been handled very well. So Traverse City isn't very big. It was snowing, but I had the day to myself. So I got a handful of the flyers and I drove around law firm to law firm, passing out the flyers and introducing myself. And I walked into one firm and the attorney was talking to his uh, assistant there when I walked in and he asked if he could help me and I handed him the flyer. And I said, I just wanted to introduce myself and tell you that I'm um, 
I'm the speaker tomorrow and I'd love to see you in the program. And he looked at it and he said, under earning, uh, making more money. Nope, not interested. And I said, really? And he said, nope, I don't want to earn any more money. And I said, well, that's interesting. Would you mind telling me why? And he said, IRS will just take it from me. And I thought, okay, IRS doesn't take 100%, although it may seem like it at times. Uh, and that was his fear of money being taken away from him. He didn't want to earn more. He, he, he may or may not have been earning enough. I don't know what his income was at that point, but he was in his comfort zone. He knew how to deal with that. He knew how much he would have to pay in taxes. He knew how much you know, his expenses were or whatever, and that was it. So you need to think about what is your fear around earning more money? Uh, what's, what's blocking you from uh, raising your rates, from billing for all that you do, from taking advance fee deposits up front, uh, from sorting through your clients and taking only the ones that you think can afford you and that you like to work with? How does under earning benefit you? You know, all of us, by the time we get to this age, I think, know that psychologists tell us there is a payoff for us in all behaviors, positive and negative. This is obviously a negative behavior, so you need to think about how under-earning is benefiting you. Uh, Gary, you have another comment? Yeah, let me just, I'd like to jump in there, too. Just, I think sure. I might have a little bit of an unusual experience from people who are um, on the call in that I moved from practicing law full time to starting a software business. And that sort of thing, you know, that's a jump that really requires you to, to confront your fears, you know, to start yeah. something right out of the ground. And so I would say, don't underestimate this issue. Even if you think like you're doing fairly well in your practice, it's given me a very different perspective on practicing law to, you know, to have gone out and, um, taking an idea from nothing into a real company and raising money and all the things that you have to do associated with that that were totally outside my comfort zone. Now, you may not want to do that, but there still are, you know, aspects of your practice where you're not necessarily feeling satisfied or, you know, it doesn't really wind your watch the way you want or it doesn't re produce the, the money that you want that and and in my experience, fear is the major uh, uh, component of what's keeping you back. So it's, it's important to kind of dig deep on this issue if, if you're, you know, if there is some dissatisfaction with what you're earning. And, and that, you know, can be a, a symptom of other um, uh, aspects of your practice that aren't that you're not happy with. Usually if you're pretty happy with your practice, it's going to produce a good income as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think this, this is what really resonated to, with me about this is confront those fears, really think about them and spend time going, okay, what am, what's, what am, what's blocking me? What, how am I blocking myself from doing better? Excellent point. Thank you so much. Uh, and yes, starting something new that you're completely unfamiliar with is terrifying, uh, as it was for the folks on the line who started their own practice. And uh, if you came out of another law firm, it still would be a jolt to the system to try to figure out how to do this. But especially if you just started out uh, and hung out your shingle, um, the blessing is that you didn't know what you didn't know. So uh, not maybe quite as terrifying up front, but fear holds back uh, a lot of people. And I'll give you a quick example here. I'll be working with a client and I'll be dealing with something that they're struggling with. And I'm trying to come up with a really good solution. And it might be a marketing strategy. It might be some financial issue that they're dealing with or whatever. And I'll do a lot of thinking on this and I'll come up with something that I think is great. And I can't wait to see them. The next time I am with them, I, Say, listen, here's what I've been thinking. This is what we're going to do. And the kiss of death is when they sit back and look at me and fold their arms and say, that's very interesting. Who else is doing that? And how is it working for them? That's the fear. Uh, and, and my response always is, do you want to be Avis or do you want to be Hertz? Do you want to be cutting edge and leading the pack? Or do you want to always be following along behind, trying to play catch up because you never will? 
Uh, so fear is a big factor here. All right, some behaviors that cause attorneys to under and failing to tend to the business side of the practice. And I'll expand on that in just a moment. Accepting bad cases of clients, accepting clients who can't pay, undervaluing your work, giving away time, and failure to market effectively. In my book, there's a whole chapter on under earning, and I've identified more than 30 ways that attorneys under earn. I don't have time to get into all of them today, but these are the ones that I see most often. Discounting fees, that is a big one. I hate discounting fees. Uh, and let me tell you this, there are times when discounting is appropriate. If you have a good client and they've complained about your bill uh, and you want to save that relationship, by all means, offer a discount. If you haven't done your best work and you know that, you feel bad about it, discount your fees. But don't just make it a standard practice and certainly don't discount fees to encourage prompt payment because that sends the entirely wrong message to your client. And the thing that I have come to realize is if you discount your fees to for a bad client because they're not paying and you say, I'll take 15% off if you'll pay up in the next you know, 10 days or whatever. If I'm your good client and I'm faithfully paying your bill every month and I'm paying it 100%, how am I going to feel if I find out that you know, Joe Blow over here is getting a 15% discount off of his fee because he's not paying you? So discounting fees just to encourage prompt payment is not fair to your good clients. Um, I, I know attorneys who just automatically discount and I, that drives me nuts. The thing, the problem is you don't want to offer a discount until you've spoken to your client and so many attorneys discount their fees before they even send the bill to the client. They don't give the client a chance to dis dispute the bill or complain or pay it. Um, one of my clients a few years ago had a situation where he hadn't billed his client for about two months, two, two or three months. Client owed him about 7,000 in fees. But the attorney was about to go to trial and he needed $7,000 to move forward with the trial. So he looked at this and he thought, all right, I haven't billed him for a long time and they owe me 7,000, I need to ask him for 7,000. I know, I'll discount that first 7,000, I'll just write that off if they give me the 7,000 to go to trial. And that's what he did. And then he calls and tells me that he did this. And I asked if the client was unable to cover both $7,000 fees. And he said, no, no, he has a really good six-figure income. And I said, has he ever complained about your fees? No, no, never. He, he likes me. I said, has he ever uh, disputed your services? No, no, he thinks I'm great. He sent me a lot of referrals. And I said that I'm not understanding why you felt the need to discount his fees. If he loves you, he's never complained about your services, you did the work. Uh, it was a fair bill, the 7000 that you wrote off. And you, your a fee agreement says that you need 7000 when you're going to trial. I'm not clear on why you felt compelled to do that. And he said, I just thought it looked too greedy. So discounting fees, big, big, <laughs> big problem here. Not taking an adequate advance fee deposit up front. I recommend you take the first two months of projected fees as your advanced fee deposit or retainer, whatever you want to call it, the money up front that you're going to put in IOLTA and hang on to it and bill against, that gives you a chance to find out if this is a deadbeat client. Um, so at the end of the first month, you bill them and go merrily on your way and you pay yourself out of the advanced fee deposit. Um, and then you realize when you bill the second month that they never pay the bill. This is with an evergreen deposit account. You put the money into the IELTA account, but you bill them every month. That advanced fee deposit just sits there. You don't bill against it unless they don't pay you. And so, do, you, do you recommend yeah. doing that with all clients, that, that you always take a retainer no matter, no matter what the yeah. practice is? Yes, okay. yes, yes, because it's insurance for you, but it also puts some skin in the game for them. Mm -hmm. And on occasion, I have had a client where I haven't required money up front. Um, and it always goes wrong. They either end up being slow pay or they drop out in midstream in our work or whatever. When I take money up front in my own business, um, they stick. They stick in. They do the work. Mm -hmm. They do the homework. They want to see a result because they have money invested. Do you always so, do an evergreen retainer? 
I like evergreens uh, okay. because it protects you if you have a deadbeat client. You're mm -hmm. still going to get paid. Towards the end of the matter, when you know that things are winding down, then you start sending bills and it says at the bottom, don't pay because you're going to start consuming that deposit in the IOLTA account at that point. Interesting. At the end of the matter, if they owe you money, then they're responsible for that last bill. If you have money left in the retainer, you give that back to them. But the uh, evergreen is a wonderful way to protect yourself and make sure that you get paid. And it gives you adequate time to figure out that they're not going to be paying you when they don't pay their monthly bill. And mm -hmm. you hopefully can still get out without uh, a problem. Have you been able to negotiate that successfully with, uh, or help clients negotiate that successfully with corporate and institutional clients who, you know, like to dictate some pretty horrendous billing terms in general? Uh, I haven't simply because my clients are all solo and small firms. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. they're just not representing, you know, IBM and Xerox and all that. So. Right. Okay. All right, codependency, that's putting other people's needs uh, ahead of yours, sometimes unhealthy needs. Poor time management skills, another cause of under earning, procrastination, doing something in an hour and a half because you waited to the last minute when it would have taken you four hours to do it properly had you given yourself time. That's cost you money right there and you've turned out a less than uh, stellar product here because you've done it under tremendous duress. Disorganization, uh, Professional Organizers Association says that American executives lose about 180 hours a year looking for things. And I would venture to say in almost every law office I've been in, that's probably true in attorney's offices as well. Losing things, trying to find things, looking for a phone number or whatever, cost you money. And just simply not working enough hours. When a firm calls and says, we're not making enough money, the first thing I do is look at their revenues. And I look at their um, billing reports. And in every case except one, in all the 26 years I've been consulting, it's not a matter of expenses being too high or overhead being too high. It's revenues are too low. They're simply not billing enough. Or they're not capturing enough of their time to bill. Or they're not collecting enough of what's billed. So uh, sometimes it's not working enough hours. Sometimes it's poor collections. Uh, dangerous place to be believing that attorney or attorneys believing that they know what their clients will think. Like the guy who didn't want to send the bill because he thought it looked greedy. Um, he had no reason to believe that that was what his client would think. That was what he thought that he was being greedy. And then the, one of the uh, other big causes of underneath sympathy, you know, I don't want to bill. I feel sorry for these clients. Uh, wonderful to have a kind and loving heart. You still need to make a living. So guard that heart carefully and don't let it get carried away here. And then the imposter syndrome. That's what Gary kind of had alluded to a while ago that people are going to find out. I don't know as much as they think I know about this. That is a big one. And that keeps our self worth down because we feel like we're imposters. And therefore, we can't earn the money that we need to earn or we can't charge what we need to be charging because we don't really deserve that. All right, the number one problem I see causing under earning is just poor timekeeping habits. Um, that is so across the board with virtually everybody. Uh, I met one attorney who records every single minute of every day, and that means like 8.15 to 8.17 poured coffee, 8.17 to 8.21 looked out window, 8.21 to 8.30 read and responded to emails poor timekeeping habits. If you are not keeping your time contemporaneously, you are losing money. If you wait to the end of the day to record your time, uh, you are going to lose 10 to 15% of your potential billable time because you simply don't remember start and stop times. You don't remember a phone call that you had or emails that you responded to. If you wait to the next day, you lose 20 to 25% of your time. And if you wait to the end of the week, you can lose as much as 50% of your potential billable time. So get in the habit, if you are not now, of recording your time contemporaneously as you go through the day and record all of your time. Record your administrative time, record your billable time. If you're doing flat fee work, if you're doing contingent work, record your time. Flat fee work, you need to know how much time goes into something to know that your flat fee is working. And I'll give you a formula in just a second for the figuring out your rates. Same with contingent. 
you need to track how much time you're putting in because you may get a check for, you know, $15,000 and think, man, that's a really great return. But then you see that you put in 200 hours, uh, then that's not a great return. So you need to track your time on everything. I know when you work in a small firm, you think hot dogs, I have escaped the ever mounting pressure to keep time records and to hit billable goals that they have in large firms. I'm sorry to break it to you, you still need to track your time. All right, a few stats on under earnings. 73% of solo and small firms experience past due accounts. Most solo and small firm attorneys are not billing for 40% of their time. 15% of small firms say their bills fall past due because the bill was for services rendered too far in the past. That 40% thing with not billing for 40% of the time is astonishing. If you think about your practice, what would it mean to you if you got 40% more <laughs> of the time uh, that you worked billed and collected it would make a big difference? So in your own business, you need to think about what are your biggest issues? What's behind your under earning? And uh, identify those issues and then we go from there. So under earning is not just about you, it affects others, it affects your partners. Um, I'm working with a, a partner in a five, six attorney firm, four partners, two, two others of counsel. Uh, three partners, this is the guy who was trying to recreate timesheets from two years ago. The, the partners are carrying the firm because they each put into overhead uh, based on what they earned. So the percentage of overhead is calculated based on their earnings. He's not contributing anything. So the other three partners, which they don't seem to figure it out, are carrying the total cost of running that firm uh, because he has no revenue to show for it. Um, he just was so proud of himself a few months ago, he got a bill out for $20,000. He hadn't billed that client in two years. Now, he said, but my clients love me. They've been with me forever. They understand. No, they don't. Clients do not understand how you do not bill for two years and then send them a whopping big bill. So his partners are affected. Your clients are affected because you may not be able to provide the staff that would be appropriate to best support you and that your clients work. You might not be able to afford state-of-the-art technology. You might not be able to afford uh, you know, expert witnesses or other things that would help you represent your client to the fullest. Your family certainly feels the effect of your under earning. Your staff, uh, you may be paying the below market. You may not be able to give them bonuses or raises or give them even uh, up-to-date equipment. Your pets, one of my clients had to put a dog down a few years ago uh, because she didn't have the thousand dollars that the vet required for treatment. And the dog was six years old, and she said, you know, I just, I don't have that kind of money. And uh, she was a chronic under earner, and I thought that I would slip my throat before I would put my animal down for that. But I understood the situation. She didn't have the money. And your creditors and lenders are affected by your under earning. So you need to think about whose needs are more important to your clients' needs when you underbill, when you discount, when you write things off, when you don't charge for some of your work, uh, are their needs more important or are your needs more important, your family's needs, your partner's or employee's needs, your other client's needs? So how much is enough? You need to be clear on what you have to earn. And um, you do that by establishing a budget for your firm and a budget for home and meld them together to see how much you need to be bringing in on a monthly basis and then bring that down to how much per hour and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So some f smart financial tools here, uh, realization rate, you need to know the percentage of fees billed that you collect. And uh, let's say you bill $20,000 in a month, but you actually only collect uh, 10,000, so your billable your, I'm sorry, your realization rate then is uh, 50%. The goal for realization rate is 90% or higher. The lowest I've ever seen was 37%, which meant that 63, 63 cents of every dollar billed was not coming through the door. So check your realization rate, the percentage of fees billed that you actually collect. The hourly rate calculation, I'm going to give that to you. 
uh, here. It is not in the slides here. I think it's in the handout materials, but I'm just going to run it through really quickly here. There, it's, there are three figures you need to know. You need to know your total required revenues. That would include the compensation you want to earn, your share of overhead, and your share of any desired firm profit. And that would be money left in you know, the operating account at the end of the year. And maybe you all, if you're in a partnership, you all divide that up or whatever. But your share of firm profit over and above overhead. So total required revenues, your compensation, your share of overhead, and your share of desired firm profit. Add those together and divide that by your realization rate times your billables goal. Now, the ABA thinks that solo and small firm practitioners should be able to bill 1,400 hours a year. I have to tell you, in 26 years, I have never had a client as a solo small firm practitioner who could hit 1,400 hours. But you figure out what is a comfortable number for you, how many hours you reasonably expect to bill during the year. And then break that down, what does that look like per month, per week, per day? But the realization rate times that billable goal, and let's say you'd say 1,000 uh, a thousand hours here. Um, and that realization rate times the billable goals divided into your required revenues gives you your minimum hourly rate. And I'm sure this is in your handout materials. Uh, I've given you an example here. Uh, written out so that you can see how that works. But that's how you figure out what it is you need to be earning. And uh, if you have just plucked a figure out of the air for your billable rate, you need to go and figure out what you actually need to earn to make sure that you're earning enough and uh, that that number is matching up with your goals. You need to have revenues goals uh, here for that, both personally and for your business. You need to be reviewing a profit and loss statement on a monthly basis. And if you are doing your books yourself, the first thing you need to do is turn those books over to somebody else. Um, and if you are doing it, most law firms are using QuickBooks and uh, Lean Law is built on top of QuickBooks here. So uh, a great way to track your time and uh, get your uh, information populated over into your accounting program here. But generate a profit and loss statement monthly and review it line item by line item to make sure that you understand what's going into each one of those categories. If you have somebody else doing your books for you, make sure that you're clear on how they're categorizing your various expenses. I met an attorney a few years ago and I discovered that her bookkeeper with a misplaced sense of devotion to the attorney was categorizing her personal travel to visit her father across the country. Uh, he was quite ill and she was going back about every other week. The bookkeeper was categorizing those as C CLE travel expenses. Uh, she wanted to help her out on her taxes. And she said, I'm prepared to go into a court of law and swear that those were related to CLE um, programs, which they weren't. And the attorney had no clue. I asked her why this travel expense was so high when all of her clients were in jail across the street. And she said she had no idea. She was stunned to find out that her bookkeeper was quote unquote helping her with this. You want to look at an aged accounts report, and you want to do that on a weekly basis. Keep on top of your um, past due accounts. And uh, if, if you have aged accounts and you want to start really bearing down on collections, start with a column that's 31 to 60 days. Those are the freshest. You have the best chance of recovery. The ones that are 120 days or more old, you have the least chance of 100% recovery. So work your way across your age report uh, to that column, but don't start with the oldest. That's not going to be the most productive for you. You want to look at a productivity dashboard, and I gave you a sample in your handout materials. This is a way to monitor the contribution that each one of your timekeepers is making to your firm in terms of billings and uh, revenues uh, collected. And then you want to look at liquidity ratios. That also is in your handouts. There are two different liquidity ratios. One is quick. <coughs> that shows how fast you can raise money in case of an emergency. Uh, and the other liquidity ratio is current, and that shows how well situated you are to cover your day-to-day -day operating expenses. Gar uh, Gary, yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anne. These are fantastic. Um, looking at the 
the sort of day-to-day -day tools that firms need. Now, obviously, we think a lot about this at Lean Law. Um, and I, I just wanted to make the point that as far as I am aware, there is no software that will produce all of this information automatically. Um, that, and and the, the, the reason I bring that up, and you know, we think we probably do as good a job as anybody at producing reports and, and documents, especially for a fairly young company. But, um, you know, profit and loss is pretty easy, but doing aged accounts receivable that uh, address collections and things, and this is pretty complicated stuff that is gonna be hard for you to figure out by yourself. Is one of the reasons why having a good bookkeeper and accountant is so essential um, in your firm is you want to have these types of uh, this type of information at your fingertips. Really difficult to do that if you have to generate it yourself without that accounting and bookkeeping help. Yes, absolutely. I would second that heartily here. So. All right. So let me wind up here with the seven secrets to increased earnings. One, this sounds like a 12 step program, but acknowledge that you are an under earner and commit to change. That is step number one. Uh, and if you are on this call, it's because you at least suspect you're an under earner. Uh, and I suspect you are too without even knowing you. So just acknowledge that and say, I don't have to do this anymore. I want to earn what I'm worth. Number two, identify and analyze your trouble spots. Which actions or any actions are causing you to under earn? Are they active or passive and what's behind them? And then um, start to build a plan to overcome those. Uh, pick the one that has the biggest impact on your earnings right now and build a plan to change that behavior. Uh, the most important thing you can do for yourself is get an accountability a par a partner to help you with this. This should be someone that you trust, uh, someone who is, uh, knowledgeable about your business to a certain extent. They don't have to know the finances of it. You don't have to share that if you don't want. Should not be a family member or anyone who has a vested interest in your income because they are not going to be helpful to you. They are going to be critical. So get another attorney, uh, you know, find somebody to serve as your accountability partner. Set up personal achievement goals and develop a plan to reach them. For instance, if you want to earn 100000 this year, how will you do that? What will it take you to reach that goal? And then share that goal with your accountability partner and reward yourself when you reach a goal. Break your goals down into smaller milestones. If I want to make 100000 this year, the first thing is to develop a plan. Pavlov's dog's here. Okay, I developed a plan. I get a treat. Um, I implemented my plan here. I am now billing uh, on average five hours a day. Give yourself a reward. Take a walk in the park. Uh, get a, you know, a manicure. Go to the gym on a Friday afternoon. But you've got to set goals and plan out how you're going to reach them or they simply don't happen. And then set yourself a daily goal. Say today I am going to, and it might be plan your work day and protect your work time or I'm gonna record all of my time contemporaneously, I'm gonna eliminate my time wasters, I'm going to work with my door closed. That is a big boon uh, to under earners, just closing the door so that you can focus on your work. Um, pay attention to your practice. We just talked about some of the financial statements that you need to be looking at. Become a proactive manager rather than reactive. And I see that so frequently that um, attorneys tend to uh, take action and make a change or implement a new practice only when forced to. So uh, pay attention to the practice, check out the financial statements that I talked to you about, know how much time you spend in initial consultations, uh, develop a budget, those sorts of things uh, that will help you better handle the practice. Be sure to bill promptly and accurately and in detail. Uh, another one in here, pay attention to your practice. Learn to say no. If a client doesn't feel right or a matter doesn't feel right or you think you don't like the client or you're not sure that you're skilled at this issue, say no. Leave the door open for somebody to come along that you like, somebody that has a problem in a practice area that you're familiar with. Number six is spend time every day on marketing. My clients are required to spend 30 minutes a day on marketing. 
Now, some days that's going to be longer because they might be attending a bar meeting at noon, which is great. I love that. Uh, maybe they spend half an hour one day uh, making phone calls to set up some uh, networking lunches or whatever. But purposely spend time on marketing every day. It doesn't matter how many clients you have. Those clients will go away at some point. The work will be done, and you're going to need clients. So you've got to keep that pipeline full at all times and not wait until all the work is done and you're back at square one with nothing. And then the seventh is delegate. Delegate away all the things that you shouldn't be doing. Gary and I both have talked about the need to uh, have an outside bookkeeper here, which uh, that is the first thing I tell all, all of my clients. If you're doing your own books, don't. You're not trained to do this. It's not the best use of your time. Put your time into billable work so you can pay a bookkeeper to handle this. Get rid of clerical work that you're doing. Use a virtual assistant if you can't afford somebody full-time or even part-time in your office. Give up things like designing and updating your website. Delegate away what my friend Chris Anderson calls the low-value tasks, the ones that aren't going to bring money in. And then number eight, a secret uh, bonus um, suggestion for you here. Make it a goal to build 15 minutes more per day. And that's if you have the work. I don't want you stretching work out so that you can build 50 minutes more, but consciously choose how you're going to use your time. Say it's 20 minutes to 12 and you've finished a task. You think no point starting anything because I'm going to lunch in 20 minutes. I'll just do some internet surfing here. Take that time and start the next task because you're going to have to put that time in at some point. So may as well do it now before you end it, uh, go home at the end of the day. Pick up something else and consciously put in another 15 minutes. If you build $200 an hour and you put 15 minutes more a day, that's over $11,000 you're going to add to the bottom line just with that. One of my clients discovered when I gave him the 15-minute challenge that he was adding, the uh, first day he had an hour and a half to his billable time. And he said it was no problem at all. He had the work to do. He just was mindful of the choices he was making for his time. And instead of going out and visiting with his secretary or whatever, he was consciously choosing billable work. So I guarantee you that is going to make a huge difference here. Uh, one last quick story here and uh, very quick. The biggest under earner I personally have ever met was an attorney in a major metropolitan city uh, who was addicted to pro bono work. And he, his goal is to bill about two and a half hours a week and spend the rest of his time doing pro bono work because it makes him feel really, really good. And um, this fellow living in a major metropolitan city in this decade lives in a house with his wife and his daughter, and they have no electricity. <laughs> he drives a car that is over 40 years old, and he's very proud of that. Uh, he... His wife raises chickens in their backyard and has a small garden plot, and she trades chickens and vegetables with other people, barters, uh, goes to the farmer's market to get food for them. And the problem for him, why he came to me with his under-earning issue, is they had an eight-year-old daughter. And he said, this is a lifestyle I've chosen and my wife has chosen. This is not my daughter's choice. And she wants the things that her friends have. And I can't provide them. She wants to go to movies. She wants, you know, designer blue jeans. She wants to, you know, have a laptop of her own for school or whatever. And I can't afford to do that. And he was really torn. Uh, his under earning was earning way, way, way below his potential, but certainly way below his needs. When you think about living in a house today with no electricity, that is just astonishing to me. So, that is amazing. Consider how you may be under earning, make the commitment to change, and all best wishes on that.